So uh, my connection to Shakespeare behind bars, I can talk more about this later on during the panel, goes back to uh, 2006 when uh, uh, Kurt Tonklin invited me down to Kentucky uh, for a rehearsal of the what became the 2007 production of Measure for Measure. And uh, I've been going back ever since, as, as David said, uh, often in the company of my students. Um, I thought I'd open uh, this conference today by um, talking to you about, take, taking you inside, really, um, the 20th anniversary SVB, I'll refer to Shakespeare Bond as SVB, uh, production of Heracles in 2005. Um, 2005, it so happened, it was also the year in which the Stratford Festival, Ontario, uh, had put Pericles on its playbill. Uh, inevitably considered contrasts between the two productions, one commercially successful, the other, for interesting reasons, I find, resistant to critical evaluation, uh, explain my segue in, into what follows. Before we get into it, just a, a few words about the text of Pericles. It's an adaptation for the stage of a popular Greek romance narrative called Apollonius of Tyre. Uh, Shakespeare encountered the story uh, as medieval poet John Gower told it in the eighth book of his Confessio Amantis. The first two acts of the play were probably by a hack writer named George Wilkins. Um, and when Shakespeare got involved, his hand, uh, it seems, is on the play from the third act on. Um, he also antiqued the, the full five acts by inserting throughout them periodic interventions by the poet character, uh, the, poet, the poet Gower as a character in the play, um, whose ancient resonating voice uh, presents the action and gives off a feeling of a of things happening in a bygone era. So my point right from the start is that adaptation and transformation are at the heart of how the play reaches us. I want to start by observing that while uh, Stratford Festival advertised the finished product of its adaptation of Pericles as the adventures of Pericles, the reversal process for SVB inmate, inmates over a whole year of work proved to be a series of misadventures. <laughs> From the very start, um, the players uh, grumbled about the co-authorship of the play. For them, Shakespeare is cultural capital. Um, their contact with spiritual and poetic greatness. They could feel that the first acts of the play were by a different hand. Its verse rhythms and syntax lacking something they, they know as Shakespearean. Uh, they missed the arc of a rising action and found confusing the play's restless voyaging between locations that seemed to defy thematic juxtaposition. Attending an early rehearsal, I got an earful of baffled dismay. Pericles, after all, was supposed to be their 20th anniversary play. Uh, the play's many characters created dilemmas, having to double and triple up again challenges for those inmates who look forward to being called, quote unquote, to a particular role, Shakespeare behind bars is a self-casting company. The principal characters, moreover, especially the evil ones, seem to lack psychological depth, while the multiplicity of locations, here, there, back and forth, seem to frustrate poet narr narrator Gower's storytelling purpose. Early on in their creative process, inmates were explaining away these inadequacies as those belonging to an ensemble piece, quote unquote, a somewhat derogatory term they picked up somewhere and began using to label their misgivings. Soon enough, however, the players were reminding each other that ensemble acting is in fact what Shakespeare behind bars is all about, even as the play in its episodic parts began to take powerful shape. In my book about the SDB production process, I, meant, I make a point about the relative absence of directorial intervention so that what is concept-driven about eventual performances 
is not the consequence of a controlling set of artistic intentions. Given a relatively free reign to reconstruct the play from the text up, uh, what comes to unify the play aesthetically is a company concept rather than that of an auteur director. Uh, a vision of the play that arises from the rituals of community-based theater. Since the SVB Pericles was, was also an anniversary production, SVB Journeymen, uh, these are apprentice actors, some of whom will become enduring company members, as prologue to the play, anthologized lines from each of the past 20 years of SVB play production. Uh, SVB facilitator Matt Wallace had introduced these part speeches by explaining they would transition into the opening lines of Pericles, journeymen giving way to the full company of actors, uh, arranging themselves in a semicircle at the back of the stage. No scenery and few props would be used for this commemorative Pericles, and minimalist costumes would be drawn out of a trunk that served as a coffin uh, and a chest for Saruman, the magician, to open and guide its contents to rebirth. Shipwrecks would be enacted by the players themselves. Um, men in DOC uh, khakis, the uh, Department of Correction uh, khakis, contemplating the text uh, probing its performative possibilities, speech by speech, getting the play up on its legs. This improvisational and exploratory process toward the final couple of performances came to feel exactly right for a play that eschews the rising and falling arc of the central character's conflicts in favor of an episodic continuum of scenes that rather test the patience of a passively heroic Pericles. By the time the production came together for four days of public performance in May 2015, there was no hesitation in committing to the performance text in action. No apologies from the actors surfaced in the inmate audience talk back afterwards about this being a seriously flawed uh, or mixed breed of a play. Uh, the SPB Pericles proved to be as compelling as the previous year's Much Ado, a precursor to the late romances I've always thought, and as the 20, as compelling as the 2010 SVB Winter's Tale, probably the company's most moving triumph. By compelling theater, I mean the, the play's ability to speak to the individual lives of the reform-seeking actors, bringing it to light, excuse me, actors bringing it to life, bringing the play to life, and uh, a level of audience involvement Far, far more intense than what we usually experience in commercial theater. SVB audiences are in part composed of family and service professionals, religious and otherwise, with whom the inmates have worked to restore damaged lives and redeem themselves in their own eyes and in those of their families. We have only to think of the climactic scenes in the, in the late plays to see here a special analogy between those scenes and the inmates acting out their own desires to be reunited with family members. It's in this sense that I'll be referring to the recognition scenes we call them in Pericles as sacredly transforming. Sacred here denoting not so much theater's secularizing of theological elements, what Anthony Dawson and others have called its profanation of religious feeling and doctrine, but rather the agency that Shakespeare's art provides for enacting the deep repair of family relations. Sarah Beckwith has argued that Shakespeare develops in Pericles a new form of romance in which community is recreated through the recovery of voice. Like C.L. Barber many years ago, who was working anthropologically and not in the wake of what we call the religious turn, Recognition in the later romances emerges out of what happens in King Lear. Beckwith, for example, describes Edgar's miracle play in which he saves his father from despair and suicide as a miracle performed dramaturgically, not supernaturally, and thus, as she calls it, an ordinary, ordinary miracle. 
What happens at the end of Pericles is for SPV members dramaturgically performed, a recovery of voice to use Beckwith's language through the community of theater, an ordinary miracle, if you will. Any misgivings, then, which inmates initially had about a patched up uh, episodic Pericles gave way to what became for them a necessary movement toward the cumulative enactment of emotional extremity in, in the recognition scenes. Was there something then about the disjointedness of the Pericles text that made this final act all the more powerful for creating a new sense of wholeness? The second of these scenes takes place in the temple of Diana, uh, Diana a consecrated fictional locus super, superimposing itself on the Luther Luckett uh, multi-faith chapel space. Luther Luckett is the name of the prison in which SVP is housed. Uh, an institutionally designated site for religious devotion, now a place for the stage. These transformative effects were captured at the bottom of page 17 of the SVP Pericles Playbill, impressively typeset, by the way, and published every year by the prison print shop, where looming large and axiomatic are three passages that speak to the redemptive ordeal the inmates experienced in their search for ways to make Pericles work for them. The lines solicit a special sort of attention from us on the outside because we're now hearing Shakespeare the way we probably haven't before through the ears of convicted criminals who have done some very bad things indeed. Here's the first one. Oh, you gods, this is from Act 3, Scene 1. Why do you make us love your goodly gifts and snatch them straight away? Then, from Act 1, Scene 2, few love to hear the sins they love to act. And also from Act 1, Scene 3, kings are earth god, earth's gods in vice, their laws, their will. I'll note that the Pericles playbill doesn't prioritize these lines according to which poet Wilkins or Shakespeare often them. If Shakespeare wrote the grief Pericles feels for the supposedly dead mother of Marina, his daughter, the lines that sum up the inciting scenes of incest in Antiochus are probably by Wilkins. But none of this finally mattered to the inmate players. Earlier in the rehearsal year, the veteran actor Hal Cobb addressed his company's initial disappointment with the play from a personal perspective. That Cobb had a parole hearing coming up in the middle of public performances in May uh, added poignancy to his perspective. Uh, he writes, for the 20th uh, anniversary season of Shakespeare Volume Bars, perhaps my last season, I should tell you that Hal ended up with a 120 month deferment, another 10 years. I was hoping to channel my pent-up prison frustration and angst through a craze in ranting King Lear, or at least to wallow in my melancholy as Jay please and as you like it. Alas, how the calls, we were given the Indiana Jones of Shakespeare, <laughs> Pericles, Prince of Tyre, an ensemble piece. To say I was vastly underwhelmed, it was polite, it was being polite. Some of us balked at the idea of doing our first co-authored piece in SDP history, as if it were somehow being unfaithful to the bar. We set out to find all the problems with the early acts attributed to George Wilkins and found plenty of disgruntled scholars to support our resistance. Mm -hmm. But Hal concedes that once the year got underway, the year's work got underway, and the company was reading the entire play, we began to discover, he says, quite a terrific story. The, the average audience member is not going to know, Hal writes, or care about the academic arguments Pericles may evoke. They just want to experience a great and moving story. If there are problems, they are ours to overcome. That, that line always strikes me as quintessentially uh, SVP, uh, of, of inmates taking responsibility for their actions. It's our task, Hal concludes, to, to discover the truth in the text and within ourselves and tell the story as best we can. This last uh, submission about truth-telling and uh, finding and telling may strike academic Shakespeareans as naive idolatry, but it evokes a connection inmates feel with the performance text that is intimately speaking to them. 
in a terrific story uh, uh, kind of way, story kind of way, as Hal puts it. Pericles is made for, for prison theater. Its scenes are packed with criminality of all kinds and with ethical recoil. The famous realistic problem scenes, uh, for instance, are tailored for former traffickers in the sex trades, not to mention rapists and sexual abusers of all types, including sexual assault crimes involving incest and sodomy and sex with minors. In the problem scenes, inmates were revisiting previous lives now comically distanced through stage performance, but also brought nearer, so much nearer. Bond and Bolt were especially effective in making the audience laugh, whereas legal convictions long ago determined their debt to society in a tragic moment without irony. SPB is all, uh, let me go back there, there we go. Um, SVB is, uh, I'm going to have to go back here. SPD is all about a penitential acceptance of the past and then of living fully in a rehabilitating present that doesn't drag one back into sin and, and secretive uh, and secret life. In his sixth uh, season with SPD, Michael Malavenda said about taking on the part of King Antiochus that his character's sexual crimes resonated with those that convicted him and which now threatened to define his whole life. Uh, killing his daughter suitors is just another outlet for demons deep within him, as well as a way to keep his own sin and secret life. The gods killed him and his daughter for not choosing to do the right thing. Hal, uh, Hal Cobb ended up playing the part of Helicanus because, as he puts it, Helicanus parallels my role in this year's company, and he also became the part of Dionysa, as he tells us after an unexpected uh, inmate transfer uh, meant a reshuffling of roles within the company. As a not too distant ancestor of Lady Macbeth, one of uh, Hal's former theatrical triumphs in Shakespeare by Bars, her delicious uh, shoes were easy to slip into, he says. Watch out, Hal warns us, for a fierce mother's drive to protect her child. Without going into the details of Hal Cobb's crime, let me just say that. No one in the company, it seems to me, understands his power of maternal advocacy better than he does. If certain roles call out to the crimes of certain inmates and offer a program of repentance through playing them, we can see how Pericles, in spite of its textual problems, was bound to deliver a terrific story. Nowhere is that story more cogently at work in generating the truth-telling relation between character and actor than in the play's last recognition scenes. I don't know what C.L. Barber would have thought of prison theater as uh, prison theater performance, uh, or prison theater performance of Pericles, but in his 1970 uh, essay, he helps me think about what's at stake in the two recognition scenes for both inmate actors and their audiences. A great part of the poetry he wrote in the climactic moments of the late romances is occupied in describing the principal people, praising them, doing them reverence, and enhancing their meaning while they present themselves, confront one another at gaze, or form a center for the eyes of all beholders. For Barber, the special sort of dramatic action that forms a center for his own gaze is, as he writes, the transformation of persons into virtually sacred, uh, sacred figures who yet remain uh, persons. In uh, this last slide, Monument to Patience, uh, Pericles is sitting on top of his fellow actors, Thaisa underneath, and underneath her, Marina, the pedestal on which this monumental memory rests. Thou art a man, and I have suffered like a girl, yet thou dost look like patience gazing on king's graves and smiling extremity out of act. For the inmate actor John Snyder, whose crimes match those 
Barber called sexual degradation, the imaginative reversals of the roles of child and father, thou that begets him that, that did beget thee, famous line of the way, allows these two characters to unfold the structure of their reunion and move toward physical intimacy. Recount, I do beseech thee, come sit by me. What must, it, what must it have felt, what must it have felt like to be John Snyder, transformed as Pericles, pulled out of the perdition of his character's anguish and returned to some degree of human normalcy through dialogue with the cherished other? The recovery, the recovery of voice in Sarah Beck, Beckwith's terms. Beneath John Snyder, um, Billy Whitehouse as Thaisa speaks about his relation to the role by first generalizing and then hinting at deeper, more sacred connections. About his calling to the part, he, he tells us, I felt her pain of knowing that she would never see her loved ones again, or that she would never know what her child would grow up to be, to never enjoy the benefits of being a mother and caring for the one thing that is a piece of you. James Pritchard, anchoring the monument, tells us about playing Marina. This year as, as this year has many victims of crime, he writes. Marina has no choice in the matter, and it gives me a new perspective, feeling some of the victimization a female might feel in these situations. The feelings of potential death and having to realize that she may have lost both parents. Both of these issues John Pritchard concludes, strike at the heart of my journey in life. Surrounding these principal people and barbers, words again, praising them, doing them reverence, enhancing their meaning, are the rest of the company. Inmates staging their recovery through penitential community, soliciting from the text as morality, miracle play, and romance narrative, whatever elements in it that allow them to confess, narrate, and reenact their crimes, remembering their victims even as they seek to recover or indeed become themselves. That inmate actors are able to do this with only the bare resources of a company behind bars, a minimalism that resonates with the so-called empty stage of the historical theater, concentrates the importance of themselves to each other and points to Lear when with sudden insight he relates his own suffering to that of the fool. The art of our necessities is strange, Lear submits, as the two of them, wretches of the earth, seek shelter in a dirt hole. The art of our necessities is strange that can make vile things precious. Come, your hobble, poor fool and knave, I have one part in my heart that's sorry yet for thee. The socially ostracized, vile bodies of convicted felons in the SBB playing space, a chapel repurposed as a place for the stage, not only turns precious things through Shakespeare's performance, a theatrical art of bare necessities adheres in the multiple uses of a single stage prop for the trunk out of which bits of character identifying costume are first drawn transforms into a coffin for Thais's resurrection, and then again, with equal po poetic justice, into an altar for Pericles', Pericles salvation. Through the creative and spiritual ironies of such transformative play, SBB actors grab hold of a one small detail and throw more lives into giving it new life. Thanks. Makes sense, I think, to start with the two people that were featured in the film. So let me begin by introducing Kirk Poplin. Uh, <laughs> Kirk served as a artistic director at the Kentucky Shakespeare Festival from 1989 to 2008. It was during that time that he founded the internationally renowned Shakespeare Behind Bars 
program, which he ran from 1995 to 2008, and moved to Lubbock Correctional Complex in the Great Kentucky. He's gone on to run Shakespeare programs at two different prisons in Michigan, and has facilitated many other arts and prisons programs, including some that have focused on women and young people. He's developed a highly successful prison playwriting program, produced two documentaries, helped launch two national Shakespeare and prison conferences, visited 58 colleges and universities to discuss his work, served as a presenter and keynote speaker at conferences and Shakespeare festivals, also has guest directed all over the world, given four TED Talks, published poems and essays, performed his one-man show over 400 times, and is currently at work on a book entitled Behind the Barred Wire, <laughs> Reflection, Responsibility, Redemption, and Forgiveness, the Transformational Power of Art, Theater, and Shakespeare. Kurt Kaufman. Uh, from the, also from the film, Sammy Byron. Uh, as you, I think, know from the film, he's a founding member of Shakespeare Hoffman Bars and has played a host of Shakespearean characters. He was Brutus, Othello, Proteus, and Tugemma Verona, and Aaron. Titus Andronicus. After serving 31 years of incarceration, Sammy was paroled in 2014. He has participated as a panelist at the Shakespeare and Prison Conference at Notre Dame University and will perform his new one man play, Othello's Tribunal, at the 2018 Shakespeare and Prison Conference at San Diego's Old World Theater. Also, then, another missionary, Leslie Courier, right there. Uh, Leslie worked as an actor at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival before founding the Marin Shakespeare Company with her husband Robert in 1989. Director and playwright as well as performer, Leslie has earned Bay Area Critics Circle nominations for her original adaptations of A Thousand and One Nights and for another adaptation, Twelfth Night or All You Need Is Love. <laughs> in 2001, she and Robert founded Baja Shakespeare, bringing the bar to the East Cape of Mexico southern Baja Peninsula. In 2003, she founded the Shakespeare at San Quentin program, which evolved into the Shakespeare and Social Justice Organization she now receives, which offers theater programs at eight different California state prisons. Finally, uh, Damian Brown. I uh, grew up with a large family in Jackson, Tennessee, and while an inmate at Solano State Prison, he took on the role of Duff in the production of Macbeth, directed by Leslie Courier. Following parole in 2016, Damien was cast as a fellow in the Marin Shakespeare Company. Marin Shakespeare Company, a performance that earned him the Bay Area Critics Circle Award for Best Actor. <coughs> this past screen, he played the title role in Pericles, also at Marin Shakespeare Company. When not performing, Damien works with the at-risk youth. So, as I said at the outset, a very potent contingent of uh, experts on this particular subject. So I, um, I want to just pose a question at the beginning. I'm prepared to let this conversation go wherever it wants to. But I thought, this being Shakespeare in America, Shakespeare in America founded this event, in any case, we should start with a Shakespeare-centric question. Uh, and then, uh, I, I, and ideally, I, I'd love it if each of you then could sort of have a moment, a few moments to sort of take the spotlight and respond to that. And we can just get into a, a more of a, a jazz improvisation. Uh, so the question really um, is, why Shakespeare? Uh, in what ways are Shakespeare's work uniquely suited for this kind of habilitative work? And in the case of Kurt and Leslie, I would love it if you could put your answer in the context of how and why you started these programs and why Shakespeare is your guy. And Damien and, and Sammy, obviously, you know, what makes Shakespeare especially meaningful to work on, coming from your backgrounds. It seems only right, I think, that we start with Kurt. I hope he doesn't mind uh, to be put on the spot right away. <laughs> Uh, why Shakespeare? Well, um, number one, he understands the human condition better than any other writer I've ever found. Number two, he's prolific. Number three is he can give words, does give words, with great depth to exceeding trauma. <clears throat> uh, trauma can't heal until the person who has suffered the trauma finds language for it. If you can't find language for it, then you bury it, and it doesn't stay buried. It acts itself out uh, to ameliorate the pain. Uh, addictions follow. And when working with a 
population, particularly the incarcerated population, uh, there is an enormous amount of trauma that's been suffered and an enormous amount of trauma that's been perpetrated. Um, and so I use Shakespeare as a vehicle uh, because he gives language. And the use of Shakespeare and then the acting experience to journey in to discover the truth of the character. And there's only really two things that happen with story. Is one is you find yourself in the story, or you have to use your dramatic imagination to uh, create the circumstances. So when a, an, a, an actor, prisoner, is digging into a monologue and unpacking it and understanding it, in essence, you become a, an analyzer, right? And, and you use those tools then, a beautiful thing happens, and that's self-analysis. And the only way to get to the truth is to descend into the interior world and to find the root, the root cause, to deal with that. And as the uh, actor finds the truth of the character, they can find the truth in themselves, and then sitting in a circle of trust, which is the key to the whole thing, is you have to feel safe. Um, and that we work on to create this circle of trust. You'll hear your other brothers or sisters um, find their own words for their trauma. And as you sit there and you hear someone in the circle talking about their trauma in their own words, you realize they didn't explode. They didn't destroy themselves. They weren't judged. They were only embraced with love and non-judgment. And it makes it safe for them then to begin to talk in their own language about their trauma. Um, this happens in a, in a process that is always invitation and never demand. Some men, women, come to that far quicker than others do. Some take a number of years before they can get to that point. Um, but that's all part of the process. We'll, we will sit for as long as we need to sit with you in your pain. And, and to be there with you. And so the process of transformation, human transformation, takes place. Are you listening? Um, it's, thank you, Kurt. Uh, and I just wanted to say, you, you mentioned why did we start doing this work. I was inspired by Kurt to start uh, this work. I heard Kurt talk about it uh, first in 1996. That's when I met you. And it was a few years later that we started uh, our Shakespeare program at San Quentin. Um, we're now actually in 11 California wow. state prisons. Wow. And I will say, uh, Kurt um, and our program, um, we do do playwriting, uh, autobiographical storytelling, telling your own story through theater. But we always start with Shakespeare. And in addition to what Kurt had to say, Shakespeare requires big emotions. And in prison, you often shut down your emotions um, because they're sometimes too painful to deal with. Um, and there's, um, uh, there's um, something that happens when you're asked to express, in naturalistic modern theater, contemporary theater, uh, it's, it's often, we're often trying to be real in the moment, but in Shakespeare, you know, I'm railing at the gods, or I'm falling in love at first sight, or I want to kill somebody. Big emotions, big emotions. So for people who um, are used to shutting down their emotions altogether, Shakespeare is an invitation to, to really be big and honest at the same time. Um, and I, we've done over half of the Shakespeare plays in different prisons now. I have yet to find a play that doesn't have resonances that are meaningful to all of us in the room. There's no play that we found that doesn't have themes um, of interest where we are able to explore the important things in our own lives through uh, T trying to figure out what the characters uh, are doing in the play. You want to do actors for the <laughs> um, outro? Uh, wow, where do I start? 
I know in prison, and I said this a while ago, the only free will that we have is to act out. But if we act out, we're punished. And punishment in itself does nothing to heal the root of the hurt. And as you saw on the film, you've seen a lot of wounds, a lot of hurt people. And those hurt people will hurt other people if it wasn't for programs like Shakespeare Behind Bars or, or Shakespeare in, in general because it creates the venue, the, the avenue for the, or the arena for us to experience these authentic emotions in a very safe place and it gives an opportunity for us uh, to heal. And that's what you saw in the film. Every time I watch it, it's very, uh, very poignant. It's uh, just, it gets better and better. And the uh, little subtlety, the nuances that I see in there that I had missed before, which tells me that maybe once a month I should watch this. <laughs> you know? And then one thing I discovered at the end, I was, Sammy's not there anymore. Sammy is here. <laughs> and that's a wonderful thing. I live a wonderful life. And uh, just to, I don't want to hog up all the time, but um, um, uh, my life. I'll give it back. I can't do anything about the past, but I can pay it forward. One of the things that, like, I have a courage to trust us. And the benefit is that it makes me forget about my own ego. And I extend my hand to help others. And for example, Ron, and you see how um, he was with <laughs> Miranda and how and all the victory and fighting. And <laughs> keep in mind, that was like 15, <laughs> almost 20 years ago, and he just has grown uh, leaps and bounds. And so about a year ago, I said, Ron, you know, he lived in a really bad area and he wanted to, uh, wanted to get out of that. And I said, come to Hopsonville, it's a little country town. I can get you a job. And uh, so I was trying to rescue him in a sense. You know, and as it turned out, I'm like, man, I just bought this house last year and uh, I'm working way too many hours, like 12, something like 13, 14 hours a day and just killed my body. I was even developing on the mill. And uh, so in the process of uh, wanting to rescue him, he ended up rescuing me. <laughs> because I decided that, okay, I'm not capable, physically capable, of, with the job I had, of doing a 30-year mortgage and paying it off. And so what Shakespeare does, it allows you to see the broader picture what is it that I need to do to improve my life? Hmm. And so instead of inviting him down, I went up to where he was at. And we live in this, uh, me and my wife and his girl took him live in this here, what essentially was not much bigger than a prison cell for about a month. But I got a job, I worked at Kia, a great job. And Ron was working this job, which is killing him, just like it was me. I said, Ron, trust me, come with me. Hmm. You know? So now we both work for Kia. <laughs> we'll be making this is just realistic, close to six figures or above a year. So we'll be able to get these amenities and things to take care of our family and ourselves. So in the, the process of reaching out and uh, helping him, he returned. Help me. Hmm. Her told me the other day, he said, How's Ron doing? I said, Well, I call him my brother, my father, my son. And I'm saying to him, And none of this would have been possible without Kurt Shakespeare. 
it just gets better and better. It really makes you appreciate the little things. I was in Kroger, no, I was in Myers the other day, and I was getting some stuff. My wife had injured her ankle and she couldn't be out, and so I was walking around the store. I didn't know where nothing was at, and I was just taking my time searching for stuff, searching like Shakespeare, searching for answers. And I'm like, just enjoying those moments. I spent about an hour in there to get like six items, <laughs> which was pathetic. And so finally, after I embraced the obvious of that, I finally asked someone. That's another thing we do. We are not fearful to ask somebody for help. <laughs> and I've gone on way too much to move on. But thank you. <laughs> um, thank you. A question of why, why Shakespeare? I would say, from my experience, I can't think of another writer who you can quote in the White House or in the crack house, and someone has heard a phrase. So it is clear that many people from, say, Ivy League institutions are very familiar with the works of William Shakespeare. But because of certain people, such as a Tupac Shakur, mm -hmm. for instance, mm -hmm. who is a strong student in support of William Shakespeare, yes. has made that very familiar to those who were his contemporaries. So there is a common thread between the language of Shakespeare and humanity. No matter the socioeconomical background, it's the language. And with that common thread, that, that common language, although some do get lost on the divines and divins, if you come from where I come from, <laughs> if the time is taken to really delve into the language and one can see the similarities in their life with the story that's being unveiled by William Shakespeare, one sees through, as Kurt said, the human nature that is twin to all human beings. And we all start to learn that even if you're a billionaire or you're in a soup line, you understand some aspects of betrayal, desire, love, ambition. All of those things embrace all of humanity, so we find our oneness in that language. I can't think of another artist, and I don't know them all, but They're I can't. Right? I, I can't think of anyone. And to speak to the camaraderie that exists as a result of delving into the works of William Shakespeare, I can personally speak for one who spent 23 years in a California prison, gang culture, extreme. We had big challenges in our group because there were many people who did not want to work with Bloods or Crips or 13s, 14s, Kumis, BGF, so on and so forth. So something had to happen in that work to get men to put aside what their life experience had thrust upon them and utilize the work, the language, as the common language that we were going to speak there. We forget all of our baggage. After doing that, some of the people who were supposed to be enemies, so says the conditions in which we lived for many years, became great friends. People who had trusted their life to drugs, to robbing, all other matters of deeds to get income, to have their way, saw the potential of doing something different that they may have never imagined that they could do, act. Most people who are incarcerated have heard many times, and many social scientists will attest to this fact, you will never amount to anything because your dad never amounted to anything. And that's what it is. So we have a habit of watching television to entertain or distract ourselves, but not once imagine ourselves being that person on the screen entertaining others. <laughs> So when you take someone like that and you give them an opportunity such as was provided to me and many others with Shakespeare, the Marin, Marin Shakespeare Company, inspired by the pebble emanating those ripples from Kurt that, that did that, 
I'm artist in resident for Maria Shakespeare Company. Hmm. Some people have seen my work. I never imagined that that could happen. Same here with Sam. Never imagined that these things could happen, and I won't even waste your time with getting off into the beautiful depth of how one can give oneself a therapy hmm. that one society or community will say, this is not for us. <laughs> You don't do sites. We don't do that. Those are for rich people. That is for white people. That is for crazy people. You don't do that. But the program allowed us to, it, it almost like a trick, <laughs> tricked us into <laughs> delving off into these things to find the parallels of our own lives and really working that demon out of ourselves through this character whereby it was safe. Yeah. And then that work at two in the afternoon shows up again with you in the four corners of your cell at two o'clock in the morning and you find your aha moments. These are things that the Shakespeare program did for me and the men that I worked with and long lasting relationships were forged as a result. I have found many cognitive-based therapy programs inside of prison that did not achieve the level of human repair that the Shakespeare program did. Mm -hmm. So I'll support it to the end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, so I'm wondering, uh, was there, was there, uh, for Sammy and Jamie and both, too. Was there any tension between um, the, the group of actors and the rest of the inmates? Uh, Kurt, uh, I'm sorry, Camille's kind of talks about in this book the, the ways in which uh, the qualities required, that the, the particular program requires, maybe uh, asking for vulnerability or emotional openness, it maybe goes against the grain of the old school masculinity that prevails in the prison. Did you experience that? Was there a kind of outside inside tension? Was there, well, there was in the very beginning. It was there was laughter, uh, but like I think Kurt always referred to me as the mother of the of the program. And by then, my position, my status within the institution, along with knowing me, Big G, we were pretty much the alpha dogs who were clean. We were alpha dogs who lived in the honor dorm. But everyone had great respect. I never got in one fight while I was in prison because my voice, my message was clear. And so if somebody wanted, you know, even like with uh, uh, somebody trying to take a boy on and trying to turn them out, I don't care what institution they went to. If I sent word to that institution to leave them alone, that ended it. Because we have, um, we, we were not, a gang, but we were a great, we were men who were well respected, and we would not physically harm anyone, but nobody wanted to even risk that, you know, because I used to tell people, okay, if me and Damon, Damon, you and I get in a fight, if you beat me up, we still won't have the same opinion about that. Now, what will hurt you more is, is if I prosecute your ass, that would hurt more. You would get more time. You would not get out. I would write letters to ensure that you would not get out when you go up for parole. That's a very powerful message, and that's the kind of stuff that I was trying to tell others in there to, to stand up for yourself legally. Now, with the, a lot has changed since I've, I've left, and with the, the gangs, it's just really just out of control, there's a lot of lockdown. But we have to find a way to stand up for ourselves legally. And that transcends, if you can learn to do it legally in there, then it makes the transition much easier when you get out to use the rules to your advantage. But yes, there, there was always that in the beginning, but we quickly quelled that. And not only that, the work itself, you know, uh, that stopped all that. I would say that um, there are there are inmates.
inmates who want to participate in the Shakespeare groups, at some institutions, certain inmates who experience pressure from their peers not to join. Mm -hmm. And that's because peer groups, whether it's um, gangs or whether it's um, the influence of officers, can control inmates' lives in, in a number of ways. And when you join a program like Shakespeare, you start to control your own life. Mm -hmm. And there's pressure sometimes uh, that there are there are pressures sometimes uh, for people who do not want you to do that. They don't want you to get on a positive path, and they don't want you to feel good about yourself, and they don't want you to realize that you can play other roles than the role that you've been cast in of convict or inmate. You probably know a lot more about that than I do. <laughs> Definitely. Um, yes, there's, there's pressure. Um, depending on the institution, and I can really attest to the truth of what Sammy says in, in the sense of the alpha males who, are, who exist in these programs. When this program was brought to Solano State Prison, it came by way of a, of a memo that was placed by the water fountain. And as things tend to go, you may be the same in Kentucky. Unless a reputable name is on that list, yeah. no one's signing. <laughs> no one's signing that list. <laughs> that so, is so true, right? So I have spent a great portion of my time inside making certain that I remain untethered to any gang of any kind. I was I was adamant about my insistence upon not being in a gang, and not being run by anybody. The state had enough control of me. Um, doing that, I experienced a lot of hardships early on, but I looked at that as the fee for my autonomy in a situation whereby I had very little control over my destiny. That came to pay off greatly many years later. Because when no one was signing that, one day I just signed it to see what would happen. I had no intention of going to the program. I just signed it. And after signing it, a couple days later, I went back and it was filled out. So a couple weeks after that, the passes came to attend the program. Well, I had no intention of going. So a friend of mine came and kind of harassed me to go to the program. And I said, well, I'll walk you to the door, but I'm not going in. <laughs> so to get him away from my there, yeah, I, I walked into the door, and by the time that we arrived, we were late, which meant that we were out of bounds. Yeah. Which meant we were subject to disciplinary action. Mm -hmm. And so I was very angry with myself for making the choice to walk down there because the guard who was coming, who saw us out of bounds, was the worst one to see you out of bounds. And just before, when he was halfway there, Leslie opened the door. <laughs> so when the door was open, my friend, being the comedian that he is, he looked at me and said, so you're not going in? <laughs> so, yeah, I think you're going in. <laughs> so I went in. <laughs> when I went inside to speak to that pressure, when I went inside, I keep in mind I'd been in prison at this time 22 years. So I knew the history of the men there. I knew these men better than any parole board could ever know them. I saw the histories in that room, and it was not a good mix. There were no guards in that room, there were no guns in that room, and there was just Leslie <laughs> with a whistle and a panic button. <laughs> and there was years of bad blood and gang mixes that don't mix. So we're in this room, and I'm just hoping that it's not about to go down in this room, because any type of guard involvement would be an afterthought to what was going to happen. Well, Leslie began the program by just completely naive, it seemed, to the dangers, the potential dangers in the room. And she said, OK, we're going to make some bird sounds. <laughs> <laughs> now, you have men in this room. <laughs> Out, close to that. <laughs> Alpha males in this room. Most of the men in this room were to be honest and, and, and for the sake of relation, at least sergeants in their respective 
respective organizations. So they were not just running the mill. So everybody in here, a few people who would stab people in that room, and there was that type of history in that room. Mm -hmm. So everybody's <laughs> like a bird sound. <laughs> Nobody was willing to do that. So it, it seemed silly. And me not being invested in any game, having my autonomy, I made the bird sound. <laughs> so when I made the bird sound, everybody laughed at me. My ego can handle that. So they laughed at me, but in the moment of them laughing at me, that vulnerability of the, the light of your eyes and that happy moment, mm -hmm. men who were enemies of one another saw the light in others' eyes and they caught themselves. But that was the first chink in the armor mm -hmm. of human relation, I believe. So as we progressed in this, the uh, Scottish play was chosen. I think I, yeah, I don't know where I am. So, <laughs> the Scottish play was chosen. And one of the other great works of the program, Leslie, went around and asked the question of, what about the things of this resonate with you in your life? Now keep in mind, there this cool pose and this posterior of, I'm hard. I can handle my own. I have a certain identity that people know me for, so I don't share with you the storm that's really going on in my heart. There's a wall built up around that. I'm vulnerable there. This provided an opportunity to speak to that. And then when men began to say, because 95% of the men in that room were in that room because of some aspect of the Scottish club had landed us there. So when a crip, for instance, would say, well, I can relate to the betrayal. There was a blood in the background, even though he was his enemy, in his heart he knew, me too. So the truth starts to testify against your exterior mask. And as we started to work these exercises over and over, people started to really like processing those things that they had had to hide for decades in some cases. So when we left the room, there was a lot of mumbling about, I'm not going back in there because people were feeling things they had never felt, they had never allowed themselves to feel. But after six days of the monotony of living in prison and, and dealing with the men who you've been dealing with because you're obligated to this gang or whatever, by the time this seventh day came, you wanted that two and a half hours of escape. But when we went back in there for those next two and a half hours, we got more and more invested. And then the big breach came when we all enjoyed it so much and we really started having to do these exercises. Now they're crips, bloods, people working together on certain things, exercises that Leslie would lay out, and agreement had to be made. Now this could get you killed or transferred on the yard to make an agreement, a pact with an enemy gang. But inside the safety of that room, men said, what we do in here stays in here. Now you can't do that. But because of the love of what it was doing inside of the men, they took the risk to make that pact with one another in that room. And then they started to open up more. Well, I, and please tell me if I'm going on too long because it's just so much. <laughs> no, keep the passion out. So, so I really want to share this with you, how this process went with me. So after doing that for a while, I was about to go, like, like you, I, I was about to go to the parole board. And usually that was just a formality in California. You, you go to say that you went and you were going to be denied. But you always hold the hope that that won't be the case. I had reason to believe that my chances were better than they had been before. So I made the mistake of saying to someone, I believe that I may be granted this time, and so I'm not going to be in the play. Now at this time, men were very heavily invested in it because they started to feel good. Lesson was great with positive reinforcement, which a lot of us had never received. So it felt good to be in that room. 
I don't know how many of you know California prison system, but Southern Mexicans and African Americans are like lions and hyenas. It's established that way. Who knows why? But it's that way. And everything about the place perpetuates it. I was inside of my unit and a young man came up and said, hey, it's a Southern Mexican out here. He didn't use Southern Mexican. He said, there's a Southern Mexican out there looking for you. And he was very distressed. His anxiety was way up here because it was that uncommon. You don't do that. So they were like, well, what should we do? And I've never been in a gang. I was never a shot caller. So you don't do anything. You share it with me. I'll go out there and I'll see who it is. So when I went out, it was one of the young men from the Shakespeare program. And he was panicking. Now this man, I know him well, I've known him for many years, he was a true terror in the midst of his gang-banging career, truly. And he said, and they called me Nation inside because I didn't follow the path. And they asked me, you think you're your own nation? I said, well, yeah, if I gotta join a gang and do that, so it stuck. So he said to me, he said, Nation, I heard you're not going to do this. And if you don't do it, I can't do it. And that goes back to the me signing that list, the reputable name, which allowed other reputable people to sign the list. So he came back and he said, if you don't, I can't. So just give me your word either way. Now, I knew he loved doing this. If he sacrificed himself to come to that building and ask a young black man to come and get another black man out of that building, when people already assumed Southerners and African Americans were enemies. He took a risk. And I saw it in his face. He had walked in front of my building two hours trying to decide whether or not he was going to do that. So I had to honor his sacrifice. I didn't have the same weight upon me because I was not a gang member. But seeing a person willing to put his gang in such a high-ranking gang member, willing to put that aside to do something better for himself, the onus was upon me to assist him or abandon him. And I told him, I give you my word, no matter what, as long as I am here and they don't force me off the yard, I will participate. I'll be there. So when we came back, everybody was comfortable. We really started working this play. I did not want to do the play. I asked Leslie for the smallest role in the play. She gave me McDuck. <laughs> I thank you. <laughs> so now the time is approaching to do the production. None of us had learned this many lines before. So we were running behind. We were panicking because we had to learn this and we loved it. So we wanted to continue it. So the choice had to be made. Well, we have two and a half hours here on Saturday. We have a whole bunch of time out there every other day. Mm -hmm. Now the secret has to leave these four corners. Are you all willing to go out on the yard and use the time that we have to master these lines in the face of what you know you're going to face? Now keep in mind, the men involved in this were definitely out for males, but they had given up their desire to be negative with the strength that they possessed. But, and I describe this as if there's a such thing as a silver lining to the dark cloud of violence, it is the reputation that preceded these men. So when the decision was made, okay, we are going to work on this on the yard together. We knew we were going to be approached. So when we were on the yard doing these things, all these weird, strange bedfellows <laughs> you know, were working on this thing together. Of course, the respective gangs were looking at this. And so because of the men involved, they weren't just going to come up and say what could and could not be. Because when these men were inside of their negative gang banging, they were good at it. So that reputation made them approach with caution. So when they finally built up that courage and walked through, said, well, what's going on? And they saw black, white, Hispanic, 
agent and say, we are working on our lines for this Shakespearean production. What is your problem? <laughs> <laughs> they really had a career decision to make. Are, are you going to allow these men who are trying to do something positive to do that, or are you going to allow them to take the frustrations out of you of not being allowed to do it? And they said, okay. So we went into full year working on this production. And when we did this, and we put this performance on in front of that population, they were floored. It amazed them that we could actually do that. They just expected us not to be able to do it because it was something. A candle only burns as long as it's wick. They had never imagined on that level. And then they saw it with people that they knew. This, this guy was he's a gangbanger. He's a drug dealer. He, this isn't him. It's very much him. So then they started wanting to do it too. So shortly after that, I was paroled. And when you're paroled every now and then, you come back in to speak to those about the things that you've experienced outside, but to look for when you come. And when that happens, if you're a white guy, white people show up in the auditorium to hear you. Same thing with black, same thing with, it's just like that because prison is so segregated. When I went back to speak, it was very diverse. And it was alarming to me because it wasn't what I had come to expect or know from California prison days. So I asked a friend of mine who was there, I said, why is everybody here? Was this mandatory? Did they make everyone come to this? And in his words, he said, no. It's been like this ever since the Shakespeare program came. I had never seen that with any other program. Those men are friends. The Shakespeare list, although it was scoffed at then, there's a waiting list now, even on the level three yard, which is <laughs> remarkable. There's <laughs> a waiting list. So the violence at that institution has been reduced. This is something that reaches the core of men. And it allows them an opportunity to really re-examine themselves and be honest with themselves and exercise demons through characters. It's like a flight assimilator. You learn how to fly enough times in assimilation. When you're there, you have an experience, a working experience to draw from. We need this. We need this. That is all hip hop is doing. It is a platform for a narrative. People have been taught to be quiet, to be silent. Do not speak to your pains. It's not manly. The male role belief system has imprisoned more people than California Department of Correction. So this allows an escape from it. I'm, I'm a strong believer in this, as you may be able to tell. <laughs> <laughs> so it's something that we should continue, and I have truly absorbed too much of the time. <laughs> Thank you. In, in the words of people, In the words of Macduff, all my pretty ones. All my pretty ones. All my pretty ones. <laughs> so this is why we're in 11 prisons now, because California has um, a great governor and, and a mm -hmm. liberal uh, legislator, le legislature that sees programs like this and uh, sees that they're effective in reducing violence in prisons and making our prisons safer, both for inmates and for staff. And um, if you don't know, 95% of inmates will go home someday. So, you know, it's much better that they go home having yes. been able to encounter Shakespeare and learn from Shakespeare. And also, if you don't know, um, correctional officers, it's a terrible job. They have very high rates of suicide, divorce, substance abuse, depression, anxiety, and spousal abuse and very short life expectancies. Mm -hmm. The life expectancy of a parole officer is about 55, 60, something wow. like that, like 10 years shorter than, than, other, than, than the average. And so my belief is that, um, I mean, what we're seeing in California is that the leaders 
our government, our state government, and also wardens and people who run the CDCR, the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, it's in the name, those people are seeing the effectiveness of this program. We don't always see it with the officers we encounter on a day-to-day basis, but my belief is that those officers could buy in more to believing that they are being part of rehabilitating people who are going to go back and make our society, our communities better, that they would have better job satisfaction, feel better about themselves, and stop dying so young. That's my belief. By the way, the opposite thing is happening in Kentucky, where you have a Republican governor, and I mean, when I first started going down there, it was a minimum security. Medium. 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 It's now max. Yeah. They're all max now in Kentucky. All prisons. And that means certain, you know, tangible things. Like you see a lot of the inmate actors hugging each other and their family members after the show. Well, that's not allowed in Kentucky. In fact, they bring out wardens and the inmates have to stand behind them and I don't know, there's a couple of feet you have to keep between yourself and, you know, that's really a terrible thing. You know, they wait all year for this contact and it's sadistically denied them. Punishment. And let's not forget that our love in this country of mass incarceration is something that's just happened in the last 45 or 50 years. In 1973, we incarcerated 315,000 people in the United States, and now it's close to 2.3 million. And that is not because people are worse than they were 50 years ago. It's because we as a country, for a myriad of reasons, decided that we wanted to build a new prison every week and start locking people up in them in numbers that make the United States the largest prison society uh, country in the world, with 5% of the world's population, 25% of the world's mm-hmm. prisoners, and um, this is the land of the free. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kurt, Leslie said that the reason she got started with Shakespeare in Prison Program was your inspiration. What about you? How did you come to do this work? What was your inspiration? How did, what was your path? Well, the, 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 the simple uh, journey, and of course, none of the journeys are simple. I was working uh, with uh, teenagers um, that had been labeled as uh, juvenile delinquents, as failures, as incorrigible, you know, all of the horrible labels they put on, on, on them. Um, I just found myself, I've always gravitated towards the outside, which is why I love Shakespeare, because he writes about the outsiders. And, and uh, my heart always went to those that were rejected, those that were different. And uh, so I was working with them and I, uh, I'm, a, I'm from North Dakota. I was raised in a community of about 50 people. And I went to school with four kids in my grade. Um, and and uh, 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 essentially white people. The differences ended up, well, you know, he's a German. Well, you know those Norwegians. <laughs> so it had to do with that kind of uh, experience. And so um, when I came to start working with, with this particular population, it was, they, you know, they were urban. They were urbanites um, uh, that had come from poverty and come from uh, 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 racism and had come from uh, low socioeconomic and had come from single uh, uh, parent households or, or no parents and abandonment and, you know all of these these uh, experiences that weren't in my life experience um, and and so I was finding my way is how 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 do I how do I help how do I assist how can I be um, and I had an opportunity to go uh, into prison on a, pro- a program that was started by a sociologist Kurt Bergstrand at Bellarmine University called Books Behind Bars, which was a literacy-based program that he started with uh, a high-risk middle school that I was working in and uh, a hand-picked group of prisoners at Luther Luckett. Sammy was a member of Books Behind Bars. 
And, um, and what he was doing is they were reading the same book, S.C. E. Hinton novels is what he started with, a marvelous writer for, for juveniles. Uh, and both groups read it, and then they would load the kids up on the bus and take them to the prison, uh, hopefully giving them experience to say, well, here's what it's like behind bars, and, and go through all of the, the, the different uh, security measures to get to the inner sanctum, which was the visitor's room where sat about a dozen uh, large, burly uh, men. And then they would facilitate a, a, a discussion about the common thread, which was the book. So uh, uh, he told me about it, and I said, wow, that, I, I, I asked him if I could come visit. He said, sure. And I said, and then I said, you know, have you ever thought about theater? And he said, no, why, why would I think about theater? And I said, well, um, you know, uh, reading about, we all know that reading develops empathy, because uh, it takes you to another place in time and gives you an opportunity to see through the eyes of someone that's different than you. Uh, but I said, when you have to inhabit a character, you have to figure out the motivations and justifications for what it is that they do. I said, it's just a deeper and more rich experience. Uh, and, and I used the works of Shakespeare. Well, that sort of shocked him even more, because he said, I, I, don't know, I didn't like Shakespeare. Uh, and, uh, but the more I talked to him, the more he, he, he converted. And so we added, uh, as a part of Books Behind Bars, in the spring of the year, because it's Willie's birthday, uh, a study of a play, common play, and then each group would produce the same scene and they would come together and perform each other. And then the Romeo prisoner could sit down and talk to the Romeo eighth grader mm -hmm. and find common ground. Mm -hmm. So I, I went to see if I, I felt if I could have gained the confidence of the prisoners and have a conversation with them, particularly those that came from an experience that I didn't have, that I could learn secrets and how to uh, uh, find a way of dissuading them from, from following uh, the trajectory that they were on. And uh, well, the end result is, is that uh, I stayed for, this is my 24th year. So I told the guys that uh, when I came back uh, a couple of times, I thought, I really like this. And I said, you know guys, I'll continue to come back until you waste my time. Because I'm volunteering my time, um, uh, then I'll go away. Like I say, 24 years have gone by and haven't wasted my time. Well, tell, tell them about them kicking you out. What happened then? <laughs> well, um, it, it, you know, it, 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 I told the guy, what had happened was is we lost the warden who um, was uh, uh, supporting the program. And the only reason he supported the program is because he supported it, his two psychologists and they both uh, spoke on behalf of the power of the program. And so he said, okay, and so they, that became my ticket inside, was on the back of, of the of, uh, psychology program. Well, he left, and, and all of a sudden we didn't have um, a warden that was supportive. We got an acting warden, and I was booted out, because also at the same time the psychologist that had been supporting me left too. So I just told the guys that, I said, look, I just believe that I'm gonna do everything in my power to get back in here, and even though you may not hear, just know that I'm working in that direction. And all you have to do is continue to meet as a group and work on Shakespeare, on the yard, in the bullpen, in your housing units, to show them that no matter whether they have a facilitator or not, the power of the work is gonna go on. And uh, when they got uh, finally an acting warden from Tennessee, I did some research and I found out he was a teacher. And so I thought, okay, I, I come from teachers. My parents escaped the family farm by becoming teachers. And so I, I prepared all of this, uh, all this documentation and I requested a meeting with him and uh, he granted it. And, and I sat down with him and I showed him the, the, all the power of the good, the good uh, publicity we'd had and the reduction of violence and, and who these prisoners were and what their reputation was prior to joining, all this stuff. He sat and listened and then he said, so uh, let's have you make a formal application to the Department of Corrections to get this program on their books. And once you're on their books, you're better protected. And so that's what he did is he helped me prepare this document that went to the DOC. They approved it. And shortly after they approved it, I came back. It was about a, a six months, I think I was six gone. Months. And then here's the universe working. Then that warden was gone. Oh. He left. And that's when Larry Chandler, who you meet in this film, comes. And I walked through the gate uh, one day and I saw this, went through security and there was this tall, distinguished looking 
man standing there. And I thought, I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I came through the door and uh, he uh, said, uh, hello, I'm Warden Larry Chandler. I'm the new warden here. And I said, well, I'm, he says, oh, I know who you are. And I thought, okay, <laughs> curtain down. <laughs> and he stuck out his hand and he shook my hand. And he said, I've been following your program from the very beginning. I was out in Green River, which is a pro prison out in Western Kentucky. I tried to start the program and I couldn't get it going because I didn't have you. So I came here. Now there's some smoke in that. <laughs> but, you know, without that warden, without Larry Chandler, this documentary never would have been made. So it's blessings along the way. And people in corrections, I've met some amazing human beings that work in corrections uh, uh, that have been helpful. So that's, that's the journey. <laughs> Okay, so why don't we open things up to the uh, audience? If you have questions you'd like to ask any or all of our panelists? We're recording this for posterity, so the likelihood is that your your question will be unintelligible. So I'll repeat. I mean, not to the panelists, but to posterity. So I may repeat it. But uh, we're not one of those organizations that has people roaming the aisle. <coughs> Thank you. Well, the program, the documentation, it seems to work pretty well for men. Can you perhaps speak to how it is or has it been tried with women? There's a question about how uh, similar programs work with women. One of our prisons that we work in is a women's prison. Uh, California has 39 prisons. Three of them are women's prisons. Three of them are juvenile facilities, and the rest are men's prisons. So far more men are incarcerated than women. But um, the program with women has been Great. The particular every prison that you work in has its own culture and its own Fight. interesting things about it. Um, the particular prison we work in with women is, was not meant to be a women's prison. It's very small, uh, and there's 400 women. It's all dorms, and the women have very little privacy. I mean, they they never have a moment when they can be by themselves. Um, so, and, and women, a women's prison just has a, has different culture. Um, in men's prison, there there are romantic relationships that happen, but I never hear about them. In women's prisons, we hear about that all the time. So it's not unusual to have women in the room mad at each other because someone stole the other person's girlfriend. I mean that that happens with women, and not with men. Women can be. Um, a lot more um, free to talk about their emotions, and that's sometimes good and sometimes bad. But um, the work is powerful uh, wherever we've taken it. Uh, even we, we have programs on maximum, medium, and, and, and um, regular security yards, uh, and with women, with, with juveniles. And the work is powerful, and I think. What, what Damien described as, as my naivete, uh, which, which is an accurate description, um, but, but what that is really is, and, and I know Kurt does this too, when you walk into the room as a facilitator, you, you walk in as a human being who is engaging with everyone else in the room as human beings. And that does not happen all the time or often in a prison. Inmates are often um, they're often uh, considered to be a number. They're 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 treated and called as a number several times a day, um, or they're or they're considered to be their crime. And just being in a room as a human being, saying we're all human beings together, and by the way, let's explore the mind of this other amazing human being, William Shakespeare, mm. one of the coolest human beings who ever thought and wrote. Um, that's, that's where the power is, and it has worked with every prison population uh, that, that we've encountered so far. There's, there was one prison in Kentucky, and it was fortunately in my backyard, so I have worked in the women's prison there. There's now two prisons in Kentucky. Um, I've worked with co-gendered juveniles in their programs, 
and I helped to start a, a program. There's one female prison in, in Michigan. It's on the other side of the state, so I helped a colleague of mine start a program, a Shakespeare Blind Bars program there. It's a great success. And uh, two years ago, I came down to the Old Globe to help them start a program in the San Diego jail, uh, uh, which is for women. It's a women's prison. So, um, and there, there are other uh, programs around the country, around the world, that work in both male and female and in juvenile co-gendered facilities. So, um, like Leslie said, there are just simply more male, adult male prisons than anything else. Sure. Are the participants self-selected or in the film focused on a few of the actors? But I wondered how did those sets get built? Uh, could anyone that signed the list show up and be part of it? Or you mentioned a, a, a waiting list. So I just wondered how the logistics work. For us, it's the power of volunteerism. You know, the, the prisoners are told what they, uh, everything. They take away choice for them, and they're told when to get up, when to go to bed, when to eat, when to do, when to go to rec room, you know, all of that stuff. Um, so uh, uh, I, when I created the program, it had to be a program that was all volunteer. Um, and, uh, and it also could self-perpetuate, is that it wasn't going to have a three-month uh, length of time and then end, which is the antithesis of what most prison programs are. There, they have if, if you take a, 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 a violent offender uh, uh, program, it has a beginning, a middle, and it ends. Uh, with us, we're more like NA or AA that just goes on and on and on because I want the the the, the elders. Uh, it's based on indigenous. Uh, I want the elders to become the mentors for the for the next generation. And, uh, and, and whoever wants to be involved, they can be involved for as long as they want. We do have a cap only on the number that we work with uh, up at each, t each time. For us, the cap is 30, then we have to start a new circle. But uh, we don't turn anybody down. And we, we also, we protect the program too, because we sponsor, if I sponsor someone, then I'm responsible for that, that, that person. Then it's really big brother, you, you know, yeah. younger brother. There's a sponsor, mentor. And you saw the guy who was uh, doing the painting, the artwork, doing the background, his name was Bruno from, where, where was he from, Sweden? Swiss. Swiss. Switzerland. And so we know the people in the yard who are painters, builders, or whatever, and we would ask them would they want to participate, and they become a part of the program as part of the background. Technician. Technician. Designer. Musician. Stage yeah. manager. Mm -hmm. Tom Selesky has been doing the music for oh, God. Yes. many years. Very talented guy. 23 years. 23 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, it works differently at, at different prisons, but our, our groups are capped at 24, which is why we have a wait list. The program that Damien was in this year, we split that into two groups, so we have two groups of 24, and we still have a wait list. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Um, your work is inspirational. Your words, each of you, um, and it just really touches. Um, I think all of us, and um, I don't think we'd all be hanging in here. Um, <laughs> but it's just really been wonderful to see the documentary and to hear each of you speak. Um, I'm just, uh, I, I'm so happy that there are so many groups that are continuing to flourish. Uh, how are you training other people to uh, continue to uh, keep this program alive? We, we, I, I, I train facilitators. Uh -huh. that Directors. Come and, <clears throat> pardon? Directors. Really, it's whoever is interested. They express an interest in doing the work. They usually come across the documentary and then they begin to research it. So uh, they spend either uh, three, six, nine, or 12 months uh, in the circle and they, it's direct hands-on experience. Plus I do, uh, week, weekend, I'm going down to uh, Rome Shakespeare uh, in, in Georgia and I'm training, I do a long weekend intensive of training people who are already arts practitioners and Shakespeare practitioners um, uh, how to do the work. And mostly that has to do with how do you navigate a prison system? That's the, that's the big learning curve.
So um, we also do workshops, uh, weekend workshops, where you can come and learn about our methodology and talk about working, the special joys of working in a prison. Um, we have a lot of, of people who want to volunteer, particularly at San Quentin, because it's in the Bay Area. It's very easy to get to. A lot of the other prisons where we work, you have to drive an hour or two or three to get to, um, or more. So we've trained a lot of people hands-on uh, as um, assistants, as volunteers in our, in our programs, mostly at San Quentin. Um, the, the woman who I work most closely with is a licensed drama therapist and teaches um, students who are getting master's degree in drama therapy. So many of those students um, will become our volunteers, and it's part of an internship that they need to do towards their, their master's in drama therapy. And then about half of the people who come in are theater artists or healers or a combination of the two. And uh, we have created a teaching manual that, that kind of talks about what we, how we do what we do and why. And we also have a, a really specific day-by-day um, -day curriculum for a 35-week Shakespeare program that is always getting changed. Um, <laughs> because we have, we have about 20 different teaching artists as part of our program in all of those prisons right now. And we have um, several different things that we do. We do, mostly we do Shakespeare, but we also do what I call autobiographical theater writing. Um, and then we also um, created a program called Drama for Reentry, which is a 10-week curriculum specifically for people getting out of prison soon that does not uh, culminate in a performance, but uses drama therapy-inspired uh, exercises and techniques to rehearse how you want to act when you go mm -hmm. home. So we'll have a, 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 a day about homecoming. How do you, what do you imagine your homecoming's gonna be like? Let's act that out. Now, what if something changed in this scene? <laughs> like, <laughs> like it will. It will. It will. <laughs> Your wife's really happy to see you, but she can't pay the bills. Let's have that in. Let's act that one out. Um, or, you know, let's role play the situation that you may be in sometime where somebody drives up in a car and says, hey, come on, get in with me. And you know that is not a person we want to get into a car with, right? Because they're likely to have drugs or weapons in that vehicle. Um, we, do, we do mock job interviews and we do a lot of thinking about um, goals and aspirations uh, and, and write, thinking and writing. So that, that's a, another program that, that we do occasionally also. Um, so we're trying to really create written curriculum where if you're doing a two and a half hour Shakespeare class, here's how, you know, here, here's, some, here's some ideas for what you can do today. And our curriculum um, that we've come around to um, is really based on kind of a five-part class process. So there, there'll be some sort of a check-in where we'll go around the circle and ask a question. It might be, um, what's a success you've had in the last week and what's a challenge you've had in the last week? We might go around and ask that question or it might be a question that relates to the play that we're working on or, or some kind of a question. Sometimes we act out our, the responses to that. Then we do um, acting exercises, skill building exercises, um, they often have to do with um, emotions and trust and teamwork. Uh, then we get into the meat of our class, whether it's our deep read of the Shakespeare play, which we start with, or now we've cast the play and we're up on our feet and, and rehearsing. And then we always try to do towards the end what I, uh, small group exercises where three or four or five um, actors will have a creative assignment, which might be um, write a poem about forgiveness and performance. You have 10 minutes, go. You know, everybody has to contribute to this, or a song, or a series of statues, or something, which is really hands-on practice in conflict resolution. Because we're all creative, and we all have our creative ideas. And then, you know, are you the person who, who's always taking the lead in that group? Are you the person who's always letting someone else take the lead in that group? Um, so we do these small group exercises and 
and we end with um, a round of appreciations. It might be, what did you appreciate about our class today? What did you appreciate about someone else in the room today? What did you appreciate about Shakespeare today? Um, some sort of appreciation. And so we have a, so we have a structure for our class that, it, um, that helps us train and send people out to prisons where um, I can't be there every time, for example. Right. Last words. So. Um, yeah, you know, there's only two. There's really only. It, it, for me, it's it's it. I, I am very cognizant of who I'm talking to. So if I go talk to politicians, right? What I talk about is our recidivism rate, which over 24 years in Kentucky is six percent. Six out of 100 guys came back to prison, whereas the national average is 87 percent. And so uh, that that gets politicians' ears. Why? Because they want to save money. You know, they, it's recidivism that's where the great costs are because they, they go out, they come back, they go out, they come back. It's a vicious, vicious circle and it continues to escalate and cost more and more money. When I'm, uh, when I'm talking to a warden, I talk about reduction of violence on the yard. When I started the program in Michigan, when I began again after I moved north, when I started all over, I, I asked the deputy warden, uh, would he track uh, did they ask him, do you track violence on the yard? Yes, what is it? And he said, well, the average in Michigan over 34 institutions is about 50 to 60 acts of violence per month. And I said, uh, what is it here? Which, because it was a very, very good prison. He said, it's about uh, 25 to 30. So I said, let's track this over a period of time. And uh, within a year, we dropped violence on the yard down below double digits. Um, and so that makes an impact on a warden uh, uh, because they want to have a safe place where the prisoners are safe and their officers are safe. Um, so we, we do track that, but again, it doesn't make any difference. We have, we have volumes and uh, libraries full of studies about pick, pick a subject, climate change, right? People believe what they want to believe, they, what they choose to believe. So I, for me, it's all about uh, uh, being able to have a statistic that that's, starts a conversation. Um, but really what happens is, and I'm, this is, I'm sure, absolutely true for every program, in, 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 that is that I let the wardens speak on behalf of the program. Um, and, and that is where the power is, is when a colleague is saying to another colleague, you know, this really works. It's Shakespeare stuff, but, uh, you know, it's like, it, it's Shakespeare shit, but it works, you know. And, and so uh, I really try to find my, my mouthpieces in the people that I'm working with. And I think uh, uh, it's time for our own round of appreciation. Uh, we're out of time. Thank you so much, uh, all, all our guests, for some uh, amazing commentary and insight. Thank you so much.